and tell me what you had for breakfast today. Okay, let's see. I had a good chocolate croissant that I hope to have tomorrow. <laughs> Okay. What will happen? I'm going to mute it now. There's like 50% more of them this year yeah. than oh, before. So. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it's going to take a whole month if you guys do those videos again. <sighs> yeah. Start at 8 a.m. and go all the way through. Um, I have these. I'll leave them off for now. But once okay. people start coming in, and then I'll just um, just leave them. I'll just give them to you. Whatever. And then I'll unmute them. Can you do that to have to the audio for the live stream at the video? Okay, and then, um, yeah, uh, I think George will help her with the timing because this yeah. is off, but. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good luck. Cool. Are you starting the show or is it just We're on the um, practicum loop right now. Mm -hmm. Just uh, hit escape to get out of it. And then uh, just F5. And it'll be the uh, mm -hmm. photo contest. And then go to another one of these mm -hmm. before her slides. And then there'll be one more mm -hmm. uh, for her Q&A, like price holder. OK. Cool. Mm -hmm. We're good. All right. We can just leave that, I think, for now. Oh, no, when people come in. We, we want the practice yeah, yeah, yeah. still going, yeah.
so start getting people in, in like, yeah, in now-ish.
It's weird that they were that quiet in class. All right. Welcome. Great. Okay. Uh, this is this is starting well. All right. Uh, for those of the, for the two or three of you who don't know me, my name is George Scharfenberger, and it is my absolute honor to be the program director for the Master of Development Practice Program here at UC Berkeley. Um, and what is the MDP? I think you all know it's a two year. Uh, political economy, oh, that's, yes, lots of economics, right, David? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay, Matt, all right. Um, but seriously, um, it's all about helping people who are already making a difference in the world be better prepared to make an even more difference. Uh, we currently have 57 students in the program uh, from 16 countries. Uh, the students, please stand, the current students of the program. Uh, Look at those, look at those faces. Look at those faces. They're gonna make an awesome difference. Uh, and as you entered, uh, hopefully you saw some of the work they've been doing last summer, it's just an indication of what they will be doing in the future. If they can do that in two months, just think what they can do in, uh, in 20 years. Um, they've worked in fields as diverse as women's and youth education, climate change, energy, and even fake news, uh, what we could be more appropriate for our world today. Uh, the MDP program began in 2012. Uh, we've already had 135 plus uh, alumni, and a couple of them are here. If you are here, an alumni of the program, stand up. <laughs> All right. They're out there making a difference already, and we thank you for what, you've, uh, what you're doing. All right, um, before turning the podium over to our inimitable faculty director, David Zilberman, uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to publicly uh, announce the winners of the 2019 photo contest. All right. You know, telling stories is one of the more effective ways of promoting change, and uh, the ability to, uh, to use a camera's eye to reinforce those stories is an important part uh, of making a difference, um, along with RCTs. <laughs> All right. Um, this year, again, we had two categories. Uh, the best representation of an SDG. What is an SDG? You all pass. All right, uh, and the second one, the second category is best photo overall. So uh, we had so many fantastic entries, uh, we were really uh, stumped. So for the SDG, we actually could not come to a consensus opinion. So we have not one, but two runners up. Those are Karen Jimena, uh, oh, no, no, sorry, this is not Karen Jimena. Wait a minute. Yeah, 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 yeah. hold on. <laughs> Whose picture is that? It's Karen Jimenez, yeah, okay. <laughs> Actually, um, uh, it's very dramatic. This is, this is, these are graves of uh, uh, Tuvalu in the, uh, in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the communities there, uh, one of their biggest problems with climate change, in addition to their livelihoods, is how to leave their ancestors behind. Uh, so it's really the human, the human question about uh, all this climate change, um, more than just statistics. And our second runner-up is... Is that true? I think we have these in the wrong order. Uh, actually, this is the best photo. Karen Jimeno, and this is Daniel Payares Montoyo. Uh, 
Okay. Now we're on to the SDGs, I think. I don't know what's going on here. We have, this is Ali, right? Is this, oh my gosh, Chris. Guillaume, of course. <laughs> Guillaume Hansel, we got that right. Uh, and the second runner up is, So actually, this is an SDG um, photo, and she called this one, appropriately, passive learning. <laughs> Allie. Allie. And the winner is <laughs> Lily Fryer. All right. OK, well, having blown that pretty well, uh, I think we'll move on. I'll get off the stage but not before introducing our own David Zilberman, without whom there would be no MDP at UC Berkeley. Uh, it's my joy uh, and sometime my frustration, uh, <laughs> but mostly my joy uh, to work with him in making this such a great program. So David, introduce our guest, please. Okay, great. Oh, uh, thanks, it's, it's uh, okay. I don't have a problem. Okay, so, okay, it's a real, real uh, pleasure to be here. People ask me what happened, because if you look at my face, and uh, I learned that uh, when you are 70, you cannot jump on fences like uh, you were doing when you were 20. <laughs> so, anyhow, but more or less, I, I recover. You had to see me about three or four days ago. But I'm, I'm doing well. So it's a real, it's a real pleasure to have uh, the, uh, Carmen Diana Deer here as a speaker. Uh, I'm really happy to, to have her here because Carmen was uh, one of my most favorable uh, class students uh, in ARE. She was an outstanding person when she was there. And she was really unique from the beginning because most of us came to the PhD program and we really didn't know what we wanted to do. Most of us basically were quantitative. Most of us uh, were basically learning uh, on the go. And Carmen, from the beginning, was a person with a mission and a vision. And she really knew from the beginning what she wanted to do. And uh, it took me many years to really to digest what she has done, which is really uh, outstanding. Basically, when in 1974, there was no awareness. People spoke about feminism, you know, like there were a lot of uh, some books, and uh, I don't know, Betty Friedan wrote something, but it wasn't a discipline. A Latin American study was a hobby. All these things didn't really occur, and Carmen really was one of the people that really pushed it forward. I remember that when I was a third or fourth year student, and I went once, to hear a lecture that he gave as a lecturer. There were 500 students, and it was a lecture that I called in, like, uh, Feminism from uh, Eve to Jane Fonda. And in about, uh, she really was so good in explaining the situation, the discrimination between genders and the importance of gender inequality and how it's an economic problem and how it's a problem that is really should be part of our agenda. And I said, man, I'm doing all this mathematics and all this incredible modeling, but I could never think about something like this. It was really, it was really incredible. And over the years, you can really see that he had a career that made a huge difference. I think today, Latin American studies is a discipline, gender studies is a discipline. A lot of the issues that he raised were very important. A report to research where she would really go to the field and collect data that really show the situation of women in different countries, both in terms of relationship, ownership of uh, property rights, uh, legal rights, etc., really raised awareness and really caused a lot of change. So, so she has a fantastic academic career. You know, if you look at the resume and the publication, the citation is great. But I think it's more uh, than that. It really made a difference. And if you look at uh, what is the MDP is all about, 
is making a difference. And I'm really pleased that we have someone here that made a huge difference, and he was a great friend of ours and an alumni of ARE, so we're really pleased to have Carmen. Thanks. Let's see if the mic is working that I'm wearing. Okay, then I don't have to be stuck with that. Okay, well, it's wonderful to, to be here. I really do appreciate the, the invitation and that very kind introduction, uh, David. And perhaps it's embarrassing to say that I'm still asking the same questions that I was asking when I came to Berkeley you know, over 40 years ago. And that's basically who are the farmers, you know, the tillers, the managers, the uh, ones making the agricultural decisions, who are the, the landowners, and how is land acquired? Because even though we now have better data than we did in the, in the 1970s, for Latin America, it's still pretty lousy data. Uh, when you compare Latin America with Africa and some parts of, of Asia, we really don't have good answers to these questions on a regional uh, level. And these are the questions that we need to be asking, not just across regions, which is what, a bit of what I'm going to focus on today, um, but also at the country level and in terms of our own field sites when we arrive and we're working in the field of agriculture or, or rural um, development. Well, today I'm going to walk you through these questions in terms of what we now know. And I'm going to throw out some propositions or hypotheses that perhaps aren't confirmed. But the one thing that happens after 40-some years of asking the same questions is that your intuition gets pretty good. Right? So you feel a little bit more secure about laying out what you think is happening based on a few points of, of, of data. Uh, as David mentioned, I did have a mission when I came to, to Berkeley, which was to make women visible. And back then, already in the 70s, what I had observed in my field work uh, before coming to graduate school in Bolivia and, and in Brazil was that I thought a process of feminization of agriculture was starting to take place. Uh, even at that point in time in the 70s, you know, that women, particularly in peasant agriculture, uh, seemed to be taking on more of the work, particularly in regions such as where I had been, where uh, men migrated seasonally or were away for, uh, for, for part of the, of the year. But in the 70s, we had very few um, agricultural censuses that were even asking the sex of the farmers. You know, in the case of Latin America, it was so taken for granted <laughs> that only men were farmers and women at most were the helpers, that the census questionnaires did not have the category or the variable sex, right? Uh, so one of the accomplishments, to look first on the positive side, uh, over you know, what's happened over this period, is that now we do have at least an observation for 16 different Latin American countries, not including the Caribbean, because I'm going to focus on uh, uh, South and Central America and Mexico uh, today in, in, in my talk. Um, so if we look at the most recent censuses, and these are all since uh, 2000, what you can see is an incredible variation. Right from Guatemala, uh, where it's uh, under 10% of the main farmers are, um, are women, to uh, uh, Colombia, Peru, and Chile, where we're talking um, about at least um, 30%. Well, part of the problem, and here the, the lousy data isn't just for Latin America, it's for every region of, 
of the world is that the agricultural censuses have always focused on one landholder or one main farmer per agricultural unit. So by focusing on only one person being reported as the main farmer, uh, whenever you had the situation of a couple being joint managers, you know, and both involved in agriculture, it was always the household head. Uh, that, in fact, conformed to the civil codes of Latin America, where until the reforms of the 80s, some cases the, the 90s, the husband was the official head of household, you know, the one that was responsible for household representation and, um, and, and management. So, um, even now, even though now we have broader coverage of Latin America in terms of the main agriculturalists, uh, we're still underestimating the participation of, of women in, in agriculture. But there has been a change. Uh, finally, the FAO, after years and years of lobbying by, by feminists, uh, introduced the concept of joint holders. So for the 2010 census round, for the first time, they suggested or recommended to countries uh, that they consider leaving two spaces in the questionnaire so that more than one person uh, could be reported as the, um, as the landholder. Well, if you look at this array of 16 countries, only two, <coughs> Colombia and Brazil, followed that recommendation. So actually, the data here aren't exactly comparable, because for Colombia and Brazil, uh, we have a much better measure you know, that includes all of those peasant households you know, where both the, main, the, main, or the, uh, the principal adults uh, are the, the joint landholders or, um, or, or farmers. And that partly explains why Colombia leads the pack. Right, because once you take into account joint holders, there's a lot of units, uh, close to 20%, that are reported as uh, being uh, were husband and wife, uh, or are both farmers. So you end up with a larger share of the total number of farmers being being uh, women. Um, this also increases the share in Brazil, but not to the point where it's leading the pack. So I needed to point that out in the case of. Colombia, because people might be surprised to hear that Colombia would have the highest share of women farmers. OK, well, what about the feminization <laughs> thesis? At this point in time, we only have data for eight different countries uh, where we have two points uh, that we can compare uh, change you know, from the 2000 round of, of censuses and then the 2010 uh, round. And of those countries, uh, five countries show substantial change. Um, Argentina, there the change is only 2.5% uh, or 2.5 uh, points between those two census periods. The other countries that I didn't include here because I couldn't fit them all in the um, in the slide are Uruguay and Guatemala. Uh, they show increases less than 2%. So it's hard to argue based on this data that a feminization process is, is occurring. Uh, but it is suggestive of very different countries where the share of women that are principal farmers, and here for Brazil, I'm measuring only the principal farmers to show uh, that that increase. So the question then, well, first, you know, the implications of this is that even if women's participation as a principal farmer is undernumerated for the reasons that, that I mentioned, we do see a growing visibility um, of women. And this is particularly on small farms uh, where female landholders tend to be concentrated. I wasn't able to, uh, to work with the data for all of these censuses to show you that clearly, but for many countries, it's over 50% of the farmers or the principal farmers or, or women once we go to farms that are under 10 hectares or under five hectares, depending on, 
on the size. Okay, well, turning to the factors that might explain this uh, trend, uh, first, one of the things that we know about Latin America, both urban and rural areas, is that the, the share of female household heads, du jour, um, is increasing at a more rapid rate in urban areas than rural uh, areas. Uh, but that increase in rural areas would certainly explain part of that increase between the two census periods. Another aspect is that uh, the share of de facto uh, female heads uh, is increasing related to temporary male migration. You know, that phenomena really depends on the intersection of local, regional, national, and now international uh, labor markets when it shows up as an important factor or not. And thirdly, we've got changes going on in the gender division of labor uh, in rural areas uh, where women are taking on the responsibility for household food security. So I'll be illustrating some of these points. For two of these censuses, we have data on the civil or the marital status of the principal uh, farmers, as well as some additional questions that help us shed light on, on some of these uh, issues. Uh, here in the case of uh, Chile in 2007, 46% uh, of the women uh, would not be considered household heads because they're married or are in a consensual union. Uh, the heads that we always assumed represented the majority of uh, women that would be captured by the census category, where only one farmer uh, is, is reported, uh, would most likely be women that are single, uh, divorced, separated, or, um, or, or widows. Uh, so having 46% of these women um, in, in a partnership uh, is what really opens up uh, the, the space for, for thinking about the changes that might be taking place within uh, rural households. Well, happily, the census asks the additional question only of partnered women, uh, whether they were living with a partner and what their partner was, was doing. Interestingly enough, uh, the great majority, 83%, were living with a partner. So that means that relatively few were de facto heads. You know, so it isn't temporary migration that's explaining why they're showing up as the main farmer in the, the agricultural census. Even more interesting is the activity of the resident husbands. 25% don't participate on the farm. You know, presumably, they're employed on off-farm activities of some sort. 45% say they're only participating occasionally. But 30% say they usually participate. Well, this indeed is novel, right? That the woman is declaring herself as the agriculturalist. But at the same time, the woman is saying, oh, yeah, my husband always works in, in agriculture. So something unusual or different, at least, from the past is, is going on. That points immediately to the question, well, maybe they're joint holders. You know, if the census had had space for two people to be reported, we might have gotten a much more accurate picture in terms of what's actually going on, um, particularly on these family farms. But another possible question that we have to ask is, well, maybe the women that are partnered and whose husbands work in agriculture are reporting themselves as the, the main farmer uh, because they're the landowner. And if they're the landowner, maybe that gives them more bargaining power and self-confidence. So when the census taker comes by and asks, who's the main farmer, you know, they feel that they can answer, yes, you know, that's me. Another possibility is that we're seeing a real change in the gender division of labor and, and control, right? That either because of uh, 
Well, yeah, because of the need to engage in multiple income generating activities, a process that we've been following for, uh, for, for many years, um, or because of different opportunities by gender for, for men and women, uh, we might be getting this change in the gender division of, of labor. I'll be saying more about that later on. Uh, the other census where we can explore this a bit is in the case of Peru. Uh, there, there's a higher share of women uh, that are de jure female heads with no partner, uh, but we still have a sizable group, 42%, uh, that are partnered women. Uh, here, the additional question that was asked, and both men and women were asked the, uh, the same question. In the Chilean census, they only asked the women about the activities of the man. They didn't ask the question in the other uh, direction. Uh, but what was interesting here is that they asked if their spouse participated in agricultural activities. And as you can see, uh, the positive responses were about equal for men and women. You know, the overwhelming majority of men and women said, yes, you know, my spouse engages in agriculture uh, as well. So this is fairly good uh, evidence that in family agriculture, in fact, the family participates. You know, that women and men are both involved, engaged in farm labor, management and uh, decision making. So it really is totally inappropriate uh, to ask about a single person, you know, as if a farm is managed always by only uh, one person. It took us a long time to convince the FAO of this, but they finally got the message. <laughs> Okay, well, let's turn then to um, who the, the, the landowners are. And here we're in a weaker position. Uh, first, the agricultural censuses do not ask who the landowner is. Uh, they have a very general land tenure question, uh, asking if the farm or the agricultural unit is owner-operated as opposed to being rented or sharecropped. Um, et cetera. But we can't assume that the landholder, the person that's reported as the main agriculturalist, is always the landowner, because the landowner could be the wife, the husband, both of them together, or one of them with someone else that may or may not, may not live within the, the household. That means that the only data we have has to come from, from household surveys, and very few of these ask the, uh, ask the ownership question at the individual level and at the parcel level. Because what we really need to understand is who owns each plot of land. Because each plot could be first under a different form of tenancy, and if inherited by uh, men and women, uh, different plots could be inherited by different people uh, within, the, uh, within the, the household. Uh, around 2005 or so, um, on a project for the World Bank, we went through all of the LSMS type surveys for, for Latin America. There was about 167 at that point in time. And we only found 11 questionnaires that asked about the ownership of any assets at all, you know, the house, the business, uh, land, et cetera. And only five of them asked about the ownership of land um, at this individual disaggregated level. Uh, as you're going to see, even these few questionnaires uh, aren't very compatible due to the way that they ask the land ownership uh, question. Some ask the question of who are the owners uh, irrespective of whether they have property documents. But the majority tend to only ask about who the owner is in relationship to a land title. And if you consider the, the share of landholders that don't have title in Latin America, it's still pretty high, 20 to 30 percent, depending on the country, even though we've had decades of land titling programs. 
So that's a problem in terms of comparative analysis. So here I'm showing the data for Mexico and, and Paraguay that are the leaders, showing that around 30% of the land parcels uh, at that point in time were owned by, by women. Uh, Mexico took into account joint uh, land holdings in, in that survey. That was the living standard measurement survey. Uh, Paraguay did not take into account joint ownership, but did allow for uh, different parcels to be reported, uh, or their ownership to be reported. Um, you can see much lower share in the case of Honduras and, and Nicaragua. Uh, the sad thing was is that 10 years later, uh, with my co-authors, we went back and looked at these same surveys uh, to see if they had asked the question again in one of the more recent surveys. And none of these four countries had again collected data, disaggregated data on the sex of, of the owner. And even sadder was to find out that only one country had started asking uh, in a sex disaggregated way at the parcel level who was the uh, the owner, El Salvador, that we've added here. Uh, but they only allowed one owner per farm. So that has all of the problems that we've seen uh, or that I discussed in terms of the land holding. Given these problems, I, I had this, um, for years I'd been thinking that it was time that I finally designed my own ideal questionnaire and did my own survey. So I was involved in uh, the, uh, the late 2000s in a comparative project with uh, researchers from Ghana and the state of Karnataka in, in India and two colleagues in, in the US, all feminist economists, in what we've called the, the gender asset gap project. And in Ghana and Ecuador, we were able to do national level surveys on asset ownership um, with representative uh, surveys. So they were both rural and, and urban. Uh, where we collected for every single asset, uh, down to the chickens and the cooies, uh, ownership data on whether the asset was individually owned, you know, who that person was, male or female, or if it was jointly owned. Uh, and we took great care to really disaggregate joint property because we were really interested in terms of uh, whether um, households you know, purchased assets together um, you know, or whether they did so individually and with whom. Here in terms of the land parcels that pertain to, to peasant agriculture, you can see that the uh, the most common form was really joint ownership by, by a couple, right? Uh, and when it came to individual property, to our surprise, uh, a larger share of parcels were owned individually by women uh, than by, by men. And a not insignificant uh, share was owned by other combinations, you know, mother and son or two brothers or the mother-in-law and uh, a daughter-in-law. So we took all of that into account. Aggregating by sex, we had a, an even more surprising result, uh, that women were 54% of, um, of the landowners. But here, let me draw your attention that we were looking at land ownership within peasant agriculture. We had made a, a fairly arbitrary distinction uh, between peasant agriculture and agribusiness, uh, asking in terms of the number of workers uh, that were usually employed. So if a household reported that they employed more than uh, five workers or, or more, uh, they immediately went into the business uh, module and, it, and we considered them an agricultural um, business. Um, this data was surprising because it also uh, shows that a large number of, uh, of agricultural businesses are owned by women. Most of these were in uh, the livestock sector. 
you know, pig farms, chicken farms, uh, quite a few dairy farms, uh, for, for example. Um, but a lot of sort of urban garden type of activities, you know, where you have intensive urban, semi-urban agriculture, you know, on the peripheries of, um, of the cities being run by, by women um, entrepreneurs. And it was also quite curious that these businesses tended not to be family businesses, you know, but women and men would consider them their business. You can see the joint property by the couple is only 7% uh, percent of those. But once we take into account all these forms of property, we still end up with a fairly egalitarian um, distribution of of, of businesses by, by sex. Uh, this data was actually shocking in Ecuador when we presented it. You know, people didn't believe it. <laughs> uh, but there are problems uh, with this data because uh, and it's the difference between doing a household survey and an agricultural census. You know, focusing on the household as your entry point. Uh, you're going to uh, not overrepresent, but a large share, 40% of your households are going to be poor by definition, you know, depending on your poverty lines, um, of course. Uh, so what we've really captured uh, is an incredible number of small farms. But going through the household, you really miss the big landowners, right? Because you know, they're Rarely living, you know, on their farms, they're living in gated communities in the urban centers, and as with all household surveys, our survey was truncated in that we never got into those gated communities. Right? People just will not be interviewed, and particularly when you say that you're doing an asset survey or, or wealth survey, so that is um, a problem. Uh, but it's the sampling problem of focusing on households rather than agricultural units, which is what a census uh, does uh, that gives us you know, these results um, of you know, apparent gender um, equality. You know, I'm sure that if we had an agricultural census that asked the ownership question, it would be far different uh, from this. So these are some words of caution in terms of, of thinking about uh, these data. Well, let me turn to the last question in terms of how uh, land is acquired. Uh, the family, community, the market, the state. I'm going to begin with the state because it allows me to talk a bit about the changes in women's land rights and how these have been strengthened. I'd like to think about three moments of land reform in, in Latin America. Uh, the whole period of the exclusion of women, which is really right up through the 1980s. Uh, the 90s, which were the, the recognition of women's land rights. And then their strengthening after 2000, primarily in the, the four countries of progressive governments that were still doing land reform. And, in Latin um, America. Uh, the first moment, the exclusion of women, goes all the way back to uh, the Mexican Revolution, the first agrarian reform in the hemisphere, uh, through the Bolivian and Cuban agrarian reforms of the 1950s, the Alliance for Progress agrarian reforms, uh, and then the second generation reforms of the 70s and, and 80s. And if we consider the, the data uh, that, that's available, we can only come to one conclusion, you know, that there were very few female beneficiaries um, of these reforms. However, you know, many countries didn't even collect data on the sex of the, of the beneficiaries. There, we have to rely on case studies, such as the case for Chile, Ecuador, and, and Peru. And what these indicate, both in terms of highlands and the coast, is that women were rarely even 5% of the beneficiaries. Uh, for two of the early reformers, Mexico and Cuba, uh, we do have data for two points 
uh, in time. You can see for 1970, women were only 1% um, of the ejidatarias, which was the, the main collective land holdings that were set up in the Mexican agrarian reform. Uh, that increased to 15% by the, the mid-80s, uh, primarily through inheritance, because one of the provisions at that time in the agrarian or in the Hedo legislation uh, was that the, uh, the spouse or the, the partner in a consensual union uh, had the, the first rights of inheritance. So it should go to the spouse before to, uh, to someone else. Uh, in Cuba, a similar process. In 1979, women were on 5% of the individual owners of the land to the tiller program in, in Cuba. Uh, and that doubled over the next decade, primarily through the, the inheritance process. If we go to the other countries, you can see that you know, women were at most 11, 12, you know, maybe 13%. Um, of the, the agrarian reform beneficiaries. Uh, but they, they really point to the issue of the exclusion of women from state intervention in land uh, redistribution. Well, I want to tell you a story about how I got involved um, in this issue. I did my dissertation re, uh, research in Cajamarca, Peru. Uh, the objective of my dissertation was to uh, do a quantitative study of the gender division of labor and agriculture, both in peasant production and in the, the rural labor market. But when I arrived in Cajamarca, the agrarian reform had just come to the highlands. And as I'm sure has happened to many of you in field work, it's really hard to stay concentrated on what you thought you were going to do in the field when there's something really exciting going on, you know, that you would much rather be studying. So I managed to do both things. I did complete what I set out to do, but I became fascinated by the agrarian reform. And I went to as many of these interventions, as they were called, um, as possible. Uh, during uh, my year and a half of, of field work. So Agrarian Reform Day was the day that the agrarian reform officials would arrive on a farm. In the case of the Cajamarca Valley, these were all capitalist uh, dairy farms, you know, run with wage workers, uh, with you know, fairly modern owners who had been probably the sons um, of hacienda owners, but these had been broken down into... Uh, um, relatively modern farms. And on Agrarian Reform Day, what happened was that the, the land and the, the dairy cattle were split up uh, between what the owner would keep as their reserve. Under the Agrarian Reform Law for the Highlands, they could keep up to 30% of the land as well as the, the capital um, investment. So here we have... Uh, the, the men uh, that were the wage workers uh, dividing up the, the cattle. Well, the interesting thing about the, um, the cattle farm or the dairy farms is that about 30 percent, 25 to 30 percent of the labor force was female. You know, the dairy maids that were the ones that did the milking, you know, every morning and, and every afternoon. And even though this isn't the best photo in the world, I wanted to show it because you can see way over there on your left that the women or the dairy maids are all sitting down, sort of watching what's going on, right, as the men divide up their cows because, you know, they have an a one-to-one -one relationship with every single one of these cows who also have names, <laughs> and they call them by, uh, by their, their names. And I think this photo captures quite well the process of marginalization, really, that took place in that Peruvian agrarian reform. Women in, um, in the Cajamarca area that I studied on the dairy farms ended up being only 2% of the cooperative members, uh, with 98% being uh, the men. So what happened? 
Um, I later conceptualized this uh, in terms of four mechanisms of exclusion of, of women. Uh, the first was legal factors. You know, the way the agrarian reform was conceptualized and written, uh, only one person per household, the household head, could be the beneficiary. So if you were a wife or a son or daughter and you didn't have uh, your own children, you, know, you were basically excluded um, by the beneficiary criteria. Uh, second were structural factors. Uh, in many countries, the agrarian reform really couldn't accommodate both permanent workers and temporary workers. So the priority tended to go to the permanent labor force. So this is partly what excluded women in the case of Cajamarca, because for the few women that were heads of household, uh, they were also considered temporary workers because they only worked four hours a day and not full time you know, because of the gender or the occupational segregation uh, that we had within um, the, that labor market. Another factor was ideological uh, in the sense that you know, agriculture was conceived as a male um, occupation. You know, women were the helpers. So why should the agrarian reform benefit them? And then we have institutional factors. That at that point in time, you know, if you looked at the personnel of the agricultural ministries, those that were doing the, the agrarian reform, even the leadership of the peasant organizations, this was, was all male. You know, we didn't have any consideration of gender issues in, in that point in time in the, the 70s. Well, what changed? Let me get to the second moment uh, that coincides with the neoliberal counter-reforms of the 1990s. Right? I say coincides because it wasn't because of neoliberalism that we get the recognition of, of women's land rights. You know, rather, there was been a number of building blocks that had been laid in place over the 70s and, and 80s, you know, starting with the development of the field of women in development or gender um, in development, uh, certainly the expansion of the international women's movement, the international feminist movement. I, in both of these, the UN conferences on, on women played a really important role in uh, spurring attention to these factors. And one of the most important uh, preconditions for the changes that came was CEDAW, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Uh, this was ratified soon after by the majority of Latin American countries. And the importance of CEDAW is that it required constitutional change in the reform of civil codes. So as a result of CEDAW, uh, when neoliberal governments started reforming their agrarian codes, they had to make those consistent with the constitutional principle of gender equality, right? Uh, which they could do in a number of forms. Uh, the more neoliberal countries uh, ended their agrarian reforms, and in their new codes, Happily, they got rid of head of households as being the beneficiaries, and now they focused on natural or juridic uh, persons. Uh, the juridic persons is that once again, you can have agribusiness owning land, right, and being a beneficiary of, of state programs. So this was sort of a double-edged sword. You got rid of the head of household, which made the legislation gender neutral, Right, uh, which was going to be an important change, but uh, you also affected the potential for redistribution of lands. On the other hand, you have a group of countries shown in the other part of the slide uh, where gender equality and men's and women's land rights were written right in to the new agrarian uh, legislation. Uh, Nicaragua there is sort of an outlier 
um, because this was not part of a neoliberal but a government but under the, the Sandinista. If we have time, if anyone's interested, I'll tell you the story of why Nicaragua led the, uh, the PAC. But basically, what happened once we had uh, gender equality in the, the land legislation is that mechanisms of inclusion of women had to follow. And the two main mechanisms of inclusion that we then see different countries adopting was the joint adjudication or titling of land to, to couples and priority to, to female household heads. You know, each of these uh, had sort of different um, implications. Um, in most countries of South America, you have communal property. So any assets acquired in the marriage belong jointly to the two. So in those countries, joint adjudication or titling wasn't really so radical. It was basically just making sure that your agrarian law conformed to the civil code of your marital regime. But for some countries where the marital regime is separation of property, that is, whatever the man or the woman uh, brings to marriage, acquires during the marriage, remains their own, and there's no joint property that's accumulated in the marriage, their joint adjudication and uh, titling is, is really much more uh, radical, right? And to be effective, um, joint titling or joint adjudication just can't be voluntary. It really needs to be mandatory to make sure that, that it happens. Uh, priorities to uh, female household heads we can think of as an affirmative action measure, uh, basically making up for the discrimination against female household heads in the past that I illustrated for you. Other mechanisms meant uh, focusing on women uh, that were vulnerable due to particular situations, due to the violence in Colombia or being in a consensual union in Costa Rica, uh, priority to widows in inheritance of agrarian reform land in the case of Honduras. Uh, one of the more um, interesting uh, changes was the case of the PPT program in El Salvador, which was the land redistribution program uh, to the former guerrilleros uh, during the, the peace process after they, they laid down uh, arms. Uh, women were about a third of the insurgents in, in El Salvador. Uh, there was a number of women comandantes, and their main demand was that we want land individually. We don't want land with our partners. You know, forget joint adjudication. And they carried this to the extreme that the new housing that was built in these uh, settlements, uh, it was basically like a duplex for a couple, where one half belonged to the man and the other half to the woman. And the same thing uh, for the, the land plots that were handed out. I've never been back to see what happened, but it'd be a great research project for someone to see. Uh, the results of that. Well, other initiatives were setting quotas in terms of women's access to land, such as in Brazil. In terms of outcomes, um, the darn thing about the 90s is that not many countries were redistributing land in this period. You know, so we got finally a change in legislation that's gender progressive. Uh, but the main initiatives were land titling projects or in a few countries, market-assisted uh, land reforms. Just to show you some of the, of the results, uh, Colombia that did the market-assisted uh, land reform uh, did institute joint titling. You know, we get women as 45% of the beneficiaries. Uh, Nicaragua did joint titling um, for with the lands of former agrarian reform beneficiaries, primarily the cooperatives when these were broken up, and they were about a third. Uh, the results here were much more beneficial than in Mexico, uh, where 
in their land titling process after the reform of Article 27 in the Mexican Constitution, uh, land titles only went to one person per household, the hidatario. So that same old problem uh, is uh, integrated into um, this new phase. So the women, when there were around 21% of the ajidatarias and ended up representing about that share um, of those that um, got individual land titles. Uh, let me go quickly through the third moment, uh, what I call the strengthening of, of women's land rights, which is uh, related to the 21st century or, uh, reforms of, of progressive governments. Evo Morales in Bolivia, Lula in Brazil, Correa in Ecuador, and Hugo Chavez in, in Venezuela. Um, what's common to these four experiences of the 21st century agrarian reforms is that they, these governments all came to power committed to redistributive and integral agrarian reforms. You know, that is, they came to power saying that they were going to expropriate uh, land and they were going to redistribute it to the landless or those with insufficient land. And besides a land distribution program they were to provide, they were going to provide all of the services uh, so that you had a real comprehensive agrarian reform and not just the land reforms of, of the past. Uh, the other commonality is that they came to power strongly supported by the rural social movements, uh, particularly those aligned with Clock and La Via Campesina, uh, who have been the main champions of agrarian reform and food sovereignty in the, in the current uh, period. Also, all of them strengthen women's formal land rights. And the main way they did this was first by putting women's land rights into their constitutions. You know, where, so they wrote in gender equality and land rights, and then most of them followed it up with um, you know, good language in their agrarian laws uh, that included these different mechanisms of inclusion. Uh, Bolivia, mandatory joint titling. Uh, Brazil did both, joint titling and priority to female household heads. Ecuador and Venezuela, um, priority to female household heads. Well, I'm just going to quickly run through some of this data. Uh, Bolivia did carry through on joint titling. Uh, consider here for the total, uh, by the end of uh, the titling of individual parcels, 81% were titled jointly to uh, um, a couple. Uh, however, Bolivia didn't do much in terms of land redistribution. You know, some authors argue that they did a good job of redistributing land rights within the household uh, because in many ways they broke with their civil codes and even though men may have inherited a land parcel, when it came to titling, it was titled in the name of both the man and the woman. So it really represented a redistribution of land rights uh, within uh, the household. But that was land that the household already had access to. You know, it wasn't new land. And as you can see here, uh, what was actually uh, redistributed as new land, primarily went to uh, um, TCOs, which were a communal form of land organization or other communal um, groups in the Amazon region of the, um, of the country. Um, so overall, not much land was uh, redistributed. Uh, Brazil also, through joint adjudication in the first Lula uh, government, we get a significant increase in the share um, of women beneficiaries through joint titling. Uh, later on, at the end of Lula's term, uh, it was almost all female heads that were being given new lands on the assentamentos that were being uh, created. So they also followed through. Uh, and in the case of Brazil, the redistribution was much more significant than in the other countries. <coughs> Ecuador, 
Uh, well, they did carry out their commitment that uh, women should make up 30% of the 30 of the peasant groups that received land. Here you can see it under land redistribution. But look at the number of families that were benefited, 11,000. So basically, there was no land redistribution to, uh, to speak of. You know, the most important initiative was in terms of land titling. And even though my graduate school colleague uh, was the Minister of Agriculture, we weren't able to set up the data system to collect data on the sex of the beneficiaries. Uh, what did change over this period is that uh, the land titles now have two spaces. So they do encourage the names of two people, the husband and wife, uh, to, uh, to be put on the land title. But we can't follow it in terms of the, of the data. Venezuela, we really don't know what's going on. Lots of land was expropriated or regularized, uh, but there's sparse data on, on beneficiaries, nothing by, by data, by, uh, by sex. Um, you know, it really seems that whatever gender initiatives there were initially came from the urban women's movement because you had rural, weak rural social movements. Uh, there was really no uh, no organizing of rural women behind the agrarian reform. So to sum up, uh, all of these reforms you know, did make concerted efforts to regularize land tenancy, you know, to identify uh, idle and illegally occupied national lands along with their, uh, with their titling. Uh, but the only one where there was significant redistribution uh, was Brazil. In approximately a half a million households were settled on 20 million hectares of land uh, in the, the assentamentos. Um, but that fell far, far short of the demand for, for land. And while all strengthened women's formal land rights, uh, there was significant redistribution only in Brazil because it was part of this larger uh, process. Although in Bolivia, you know, the joint titling of land, we, we would argue, did uh, strengthen women's security of, of tenure. What explains the, the different gender outcomes? Well, if we look at all of these points, uh, you see that uh, Brazil and Bolivia are very similar uh, in, in many respects, the rural social movements were either a part of the state, as in the case of the MAS in, in Bolivia, you know, or strongly aligned, as in the case of, of Brazil. Um, in both those countries, Brazil and Bolivia, you had strong rural women's organizations, uh, as well as strong women's collectives within the mixed sex organizations. Uh, so both were very important on uh, land rights becoming an issue for the mixed rural uh, social movements uh, themselves. They were also assisted by gender mechanisms within the state. Uh, these offices really do matter. You know, when you don't have them, as in the case of Ecuador and Venezuela, not much happens. You know, you've got to have those mediators on the part of the state. Uh, for good or formal land rights to, in fact, become uh, a reality. At the same time, the extent of redistribution of land to women is limited by the scope and the depth of the reforms. Uh, and that really limits the extent to which they can be truly uh, redistributive. That's very much related to the role of agribusiness and the reliance on agro-exports in each of these countries, uh, which I don't have time to go into. But what we see in Latin America is that land appears as concentrated as, as ever. This is just looking at the percent of land surface under the control of the, the largest 1% of, of, of farms. Well, um, I wanted to go into other ways of acquiring ownership of land. I see my time is out, although 
I didn't see anybody waving something at me, but I can tell because I'm getting hoarse <laughs> that we need to, to move on. Uh, let me just try to put the land reforms in perspective by showing you this data uh, on how land is acquired based on the two surveys for Honduras and Nicaragua that we considered uh, earlier. Uh, the agrarian reform share is in gray. Uh, you can see in Honduras you know, that it was just a blip, really. And in Nicaragua, that does go under the, the group the, you know, that carried out more significant agrarian reforms. You know, still, it represents 10% uh, or less of land being, being acquired. So in the broader perspective, you know, it really is either the family and inheritance or the market you know, that really determine uh, or that are really the key moments in terms of women being able to, to acquire uh, land. I'm going to quickly go to um, the, the conclusion. Uh, we're here, I'm going back now to, um, to intuition. You know, what I draw out of, of all of this uh, data is that uh, I do think that in most countries we're seeing this process of feminization of smallholder uh, production. Uh, I think that it may be associated uh, with women's increased ownership of small plots, um, either through inheritance or through the, the market. Uh, what we're seeing in terms of case studies on inheritance of land is that there's a number of factors that uh, are making inheritance more gender neutral, uh, basically because young people don't want to stay on the farm. You know, so whoever is willing to stay on the farm, take care of the parents in the old age, be it son or daughter, right, uh, tends to be able to inherit the farm you know, usually compensating the other siblings in, in some other way, because most Latin American countries do have um, equal inheritance among all, all, all children. Um, I think another factor that's really supporting the feminization of, of agriculture is all of the attention going to agroecology, um, also linked to food sovereignty and uh, the different initiatives around women's empowerment. Uh, in some countries, of course, more than others. You know, my recent experience has been in Ecuador uh, where agroecology is really, really big, right? And the great majority of participants in these programs are, are rural women. Uh, not in all cases being landowners, uh, but you know, increasingly the ones that are in charge of the land, be it their own or their husbands or, or that of, of both of them. Uh, in terms of land ownership in the data, you know, the other thing I want to stress is you know, how we're still hampered by the lack of consistent data um, on the gender distribution of land ownership. But um, in most countries, yes, it's still very, very unequal. And that's related to the overall distribution of land ownership in the, in the region. While we don't have the data to assess it precisely, um, the distribution of land remains quite unequal. But being always the optimist, wanting to end on a positive note, uh, there is some progress on the data gender front. And one is the SDGs. Uh, the fact that we finally have an indicator, uh, indicator 5.A1 uh, in support of SDG 5, uh, countries are now being encouraged to collect data on the share of women among uh, landowners or with secure uh, rights to, to land. Uh, the problem is that word encouraged. Uh, because all of these indicators are just suggested <coughs> indicators. Uh, there's no enforcement, you know, it's not mandatory, and there's no financing. Uh, so whether countries will, will do it or not you know, is really up to the goodwill of, um, of, of governments. 
The other positive note is that in the, uh, the instructions and manuals for the next round of agricultural censuses, 2020, uh, now joint holders are being included just as the standardized feature. You know, so hopefully in that next round, uh, we will have a more realistic um, definition of, um, of who the, the farmers are. In addition, there's finally a suggested additional module, module 10, on the intra-household distribution of management and resources. Thus, for the very first time, if countries adopt this module as an add-on to, to the census, uh, we might get uh, data on the uh, or disaggregated uh, data on the ownership of, of land. But of course, we need a major lobbying effort to ensure compliance. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. 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 Do you think the Trump administration's interested <laughs> in the 53 gender indicators? <laughs> you know? But yeah, you know, the, the Washington lobby of sort of feminist gender and development NGOs, I mean, they're out there, you know, and they're the ones that, uh, that are leading the, this effort. Um, I think the international organizations have been doing a terrific job. You know, the World Bank, the UN Statistical Institute, UN Women, uh, they've really taken this very seriously, the, the land issue more than, more than anything. And they've piloted a number of different ways to approach this. They're doing a lot of training sessions um, around the, the world. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we're going to finally get some of those improvements. Um, but probably not in Latin America. You know, most of this is still oriented towards Africa and, and Asia. Uh, you know, in Latin America, you have a few countries that are solidly, you know, behind these kinds of, of efforts. You know, Mexico, Inegi, has been um, really important. But, uh, but they weren't able to do a, a census. They were supposed to do an agricultural census in 2017, and it was canceled for lack of financing. Um, I know that they had planned on doing the joint holders, not the ownership data. So those are real constraints. Yeah. 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 He's going. Thanks. That was uh, great. Um, and I would say, by the way, that most um, statistical agencies in Latin America don't need a lot of help from richer countries. They're very competent. The question is whether they're willing to do the right thing, right? I mean, it's a whole different kettle of fish compared with the ones that are getting help today. Okay, so my, uh, and from that point of view, on that census, uh, I'm sure you know there's a, a 50 by 2030 project uh, focused between FAO, the World Bank, and EFAD to do both agricultural censuses and uh, household surveys mm -hmm. in rural areas, 50 of them by 2030 in 
primarily oh. low-income oh. countries. And um, so I think, I guess I would highlight there's an opportunity to lobby there. Mm. But uh, my real question is, I work, have worked mostly on Africa, so my experience is the feminization of agriculture in Africa has to do with the fact that, um, in general, when off-farm work becomes available in rural areas, men are the first ones to seize it um, uh, because it tends to be uh, higher earning. And also, uh, and so they take it, which is one reason why uh, feminization of agriculture uh, tends to occur. A at the same time, women will find it easier to co-produce uh, non-market and market work mm -hmm. by doing the farming. And so the the... And farming sometimes fits men in that they will help with the harvest, which allows them to then appropriate the income, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so I'm just, you didn't sort of mention that idea of why farming is becoming feminized in Latin America, and I'm wondering to what extent uh, that is um, a factor in Latin America. Yeah, you know, the other part of feminization is looking what's going on in the agricultural labor markets. And that's another paper. I didn't put it in the stock. Uh, but there what we've seen is with the growth of non-traditional exports that are particularly labor intensive, all the fruits and vegetables, um, that you're getting, you know, the almost half of the field labor is female for many of these crops. You know, from asparagus to cauliflower to broccoli, uh, the f cut flower industry uh, throughout Latin America. Uh, that's sort of the first industry that's employing women as permanent workers on a, on a full-time basis. Um, so there is a big change going on there. But it's also really hard to capture through the, uh, the different employment surveys. So, yeah. And part of it is because of the seasonal nature. You know, the usual thing that you do a survey saying, what did you do for the last two weeks? You know, it happened that you didn't work the last two weeks because it was off season, <laughs> you know, and you didn't do the survey. Well, many countries are trying to do these more often, but not always in rural areas. Um, so, you know, there's, there's problems there. Um, so, yeah, rural women's participation rate is also increasing, um, which captures both their agricultural and none. Or in peasant farming? Well, altogether. Yeah. yeah, if you look at the, you know, the, that change. But it hasn't been as fast as the increases in urban women's participation rates, uh, which I think is because still of the undernumeration issues. You know, they still, we've made great progress, but we haven't solved all the problems of uh, measuring women's work. So. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was interesting. Um, I think I'm following up a little bit on the same question, but I mean, I'm looking at the, this data, and besides being curious about inherently what the patterns are, I'm sort of drawing the conclusion that we should care because it is a sort of indicator for the agency and well-being of women. Yeah. But so how would you, given like the consideration of shift from preferable labor off farm and the sort of you know changes that are going on now, like why why is this important? Like why do you believe that this is something that we should care about? And like what does it mean for women really in terms of like their well being? Okay, it's in terms of the feminization of peasant agricultural production, it's super important um, if peasant farming is still providing an important share of the foodstuffs within a country, right? Uh, because if you're ignoring you know, 20 to 30 percent of your farmers because they're women, so you're not directing extension services to them, you're not doing the, the training, you're not giving the marketing system, assistance, access to credit, et cetera, uh, you know, then you have a real problem. You know, and particularly for those governments that profess to be doing food sovereignty, right? Not all governments are into that, right? With neoliberal, we have markets, comparative advantage, a lot of other stuff going on. Peasant agriculture on the whole seems to be in decline um, in, the, um, in the region. 
Uh, but then we have this whole agroecology movement coming in, you know, that's bringing, making fresh food, you know, green initiatives really important. And women are the ones grabbing onto them. You know, so you've got to pay attention to who the farmers are to direct the appropriate uh, programs. You know, and if we looked at the data, if you look just at the census data on whether it's access to technical assistance, credit, modern inputs, irrigation, you know, there's just a huge gender bias. You know, it's even worse than in the case of um, you know, the distribution of land in, in some countries. So there, there's a real problem there. You know, it's usually stated in the case of Africa, you know, that's sort of more visible, um, that you know, ignoring women farmers, you're just digging your own grave you know, in terms of uh, rural development. Yeah. Okay, I think um, I'm getting the gooey eyeball from the, um, the police um, security, but I think I have time for one more question from mm -hmm. my favorite alum. Peter Meyer, can I squeeze by there? You know I'm allowed now, so I won't tease the mic. But uh, <laughs> I wasn't going to ask this question until I saw the, the cartoon at the end, um, which yeah. I, I know that the data is is rough over time and across the mm -hmm. region. But are there governmental structures, not just programs, that tend to lead to more feminization of agriculture? Is it you know, the strength of the church or a leftist regime or US intervention or, or things like that that have negative or positive impacts on that? Or is the data just not there yet? Yeah, I'm trying to think of examples. Um, no, I think that the most positive interventions that are going on right now are those of NGOs around agroecology. You know, those are the principal ones that I see are, that are really being directed to, to women farmers right across the, the region. But if you look at the rural social movements, and this is what this poster was intended to capture, is that rural women everywhere have really woken up in terms of land rights, and they're claiming their land rights. You know, so in all of the, you know, whenever you have one of the, the meetings of CLOC is the, the Latin American Coordinator of Rural Organizations, which is like the main network of peasant rural worker organizations in Latin America. Uh, they always do a women's conference for a couple days before the main conference. And all of these groups you know, have just really now internalized the women and land you know, issue is a, is a primary um, issue. So it's not going away. You know, women are demanding equity, and rural women are speaking out on their own in a way that was really unthinkable uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago. So we are in a new stage, and things will probably have to be, if they're going to be shaken up, they're going to be shaken up from below <laughs> by these kinds of, of demands, I think, rather than from the top down, as it was many, ways, many times in the past. Okay, thank you. All right, you. well, on that happy note, uh, <laughs> join me in thanking <laughs> Professor Deere. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all for, for coming. Uh, the MDP students will have another opportunity to continue the discussion with Dr. Deere tomorrow at 11.45 in Wellman. Thank you all very much. Mm -hmm.